So, this morning, if you have a Bible with you, or on your phone, can you open it? And can you open it to 2 Chronicles um, 30, chapter 34? Keep it there. Because like last week, uh, when, where we saw Jethro tell Moses to not do everything himself, today we're going to have a look at a young ruler who follows that advice. He allocates different roles to different people, and the responsibilities gives them different responsibilities so that God's work is done. He listens to God's word and is faithful to it. Unlike some lesser-known biblical figures, there is more known about Josiah and the good he did. He is perhaps most well-known for when Hilkiah uh, finds the book of the law from, from the book of the law of Moses, you know, and it's hidden in the temple. So they've been repairing the temple, they find it, and they bring it to him. Josiah asks for it to be read, and on hearing the word and realizing that they hadn't been following it, they hadn't been doing the right stuff, he tears his clothes, he repents for the nation of Israel and begins to implement religious reform. So this morning, if you look at chapter 34, 2 Chronicles chapter 34, you'll see it's, you know, it's got quite a few verses there. It's, um, there's a lot of information around it. And I just want to spend a few moments... A few moments looking at verses and a theme that I think is throughout the whole of Scripture, but something we overlook, and in fact, often we go against. Verse 2. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. So this is talking about Josiah as a leader. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. He did what he was meant to do. And he followed the example of his ancestor David. History is often looked down on. You know, today sometimes people say things like, oh, that... That was done in the past, you know, we don't do that anymore. Or, yeah, you know, now we have a better understanding of things, so we don't do things the same. And yes, yes, the world is very different. And yes, we understand things perhaps more, some things more. But God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when he told people to do what was right, when he gave them guidelines on what to do, he does the same for us today. Josiah saw that, and he wanted to follow the example that he had of King David. You know, when God spoke to people in the Old Testament, he's often referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, the God of people's ancestors. What I found, I find difficult is the people we look back on, our ancestors, so to speak, or the people we admire, just people that, that we admire, often had major faults as well. Up there, the example of David. Not everything David did was good. In fact, he did some pretty bad stuff, didn't he? David is a perfect example of this. He did a lot of good stuff, but he also did some pretty horrific stuff. God can, has, does, and will continue to use people who make mistakes. Whew. That means he can use all of us. Josiah followed the example of his ancestor David despite 
all the things that David did wrong. Unlike Joash, who was king of Judah, Josiah became king of Israel. You know, the difference, Judah, we get all this southern kingdom, northern kingdom, and when Joash became king and the kingdom grew, um, Joash appeared to do what was right by following the law all his life. Whereas Joash did it for a while. Before we go any further, I want to make this very clear. I am not talking about ancestor worship. I'm talking about the example of somebody in the past, maybe an ancestor, maybe just be somebody that you admire, who has given their life to others or because of their love of God. Josiah was king, and as king, saw David, a previous king, as someone he could learn from. But it is this love of the word that he had. When they found the book, the law, and he read it, it was read to him, that he realized there was a lot for him to do. And he required everyone in Jerusalem and the people of Benjamin to make a similar pledge. The people of Jerusalem did so, renewing their covenant with God, the God of their ancestors. So as I was preparing this week, I wanted to share a life story of someone I have admired, someone whose example I have wanted to follow. I thought of, I'm not a great reader. I know um, people in my family, well, one in particular, absolutely just reads all the time. But if I get to read, what I enjoy reading is biographies and autobiographies. I just love reading the story of different people. So I wanted to think of somebody and share a story of somebody that maybe I have read of or that I have encountered just like this looking back and following the example of, of David. And I was thinking about who, who, who I have admired. You know, and many of you will know people like Lauren Cunningham, um, founder of YWAM, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, Brother Yun, William Carey, the list goes on and on. I'm not going to pick any of those. I want to give you um, two stories that have challenged me. One of them um, I have mentioned slightly before, and the other one I haven't. The first one was many years ago. This is the one I have mentioned. Many years ago, Catherine and I got hold of a video series of Acts, a dramatical portrayal of the scripture found in Acts. And it obviously had large parts of it focused on Paul. Now, we have heard and read Acts many times. I knew the stories, but what I was struck with and caused me to question something. I had previously, and you may have said the same, said something along the lines of, wouldn't it be great to have been around when Jesus was alive? Or at least around when the early church was, was growing wouldn't, it that, wouldn't that have been exciting to see all the things that were happening then? Maybe being somebody like Paul would have been you know, amazing. We read in Scripture all those wonderful things that Paul did. Well, as we watch these weekly videos, and that should give you some idea how long ago it was, if I'm looking down here, do you know what a video player is? Some of them don't. <laughs> you know. Um, I was struck by the faith of Paul in the midst of beatings, prison time, shipwrecks, and eventually death. The question for me was, am I really open to suffer for Jesus? Do I want the good stuff? 
Or am I willing to change all aspects of my life so others can hear the good news, if that's what's required? Sadly, I wasn't as confident as I thought I would be, and perhaps being poor wouldn't be so good after all. Have a quote from a second person. Literal adherence to the principles laid down by Jesus Christ would without a doubt result in worldwide revolution. A revolution motivated by love, a revolution executed by love, and a revolution culminating in love. George Vua was the founder of OM. Anybody, anybody know what OM is? Operation Mobilization. Operation Mobilization. Anybody? Okay, so who knows Operation Mobilization? Put your hand up if you've ever heard of it. There's only a couple of you. Hands up those who have heard of YWAM. A lot more. Quite similar in some ways. Um, and interestingly enough, both of these gentlemen, Lauren Cunningham and George Vua, were around the same time, and I didn't know this, both of them passed away this year. OEM's founder, George Vua, passed away this year at the age of 84. His radical life was devoted to sharing God's love worldwide as an inspiration and a challenge to so many. Now, I'm going to read a tribute um, you can find on the website, but in midst of this reading, I'm going to include a little bit of my interaction with him many years ago when I was um, working for OJ. And I only got to see him personally on a, on a small, a few times, um, but it made an impact. I had the privilege of meeting George personally and having a meal with him. Um, I also want to say, although I admire him greatly, I also never felt that I wanted to copy him. He's too scary. God wanted something different from him than he did from me, and I knew that. But he wants people everywhere in business, and homes, and community to serve God. And that's what George wanted from people. George was similar to Lauren Cunningham, but what I appreciated about George and, and Lauren appeared to be promoting the same thing even later in life. And what changed Josiah is what changed these men particularly George, because that's who we're looking at. And that is the Word of God. He wanted everyone to have access to this, to have access to a Bible, to have access to God's Word. So George was born in New Jersey, USA in 1938. And when he was 14 years old, a woman named Dorothy Clapp gave him a copy of the Gospel of John. Mrs. Clapp prayed for 18 years for the students at George's school to become passionate Jesus followers. And George attended a Billy Graham um, meeting in New York City where he made a personal commitment to Christ. His entire life changed after that. Inspired by Jesus' commission to go and make disciples, George began sharing his faith with fellow students. Within a year, now I am looking at some people, and I'm not looking at them to say, I expect this from you because I never did it, but it's pretty amazing. Within a year, 200 of his fellow students had decided to follow Christ. At college in Tennessee, George became burdened for those without access to the Bible. So, what he decided to do 
with a friend of his in 1957 was to sell some of their possessions to fund a road trip to Mexico taking 20,000 Spanish language tracts and 10,000 gospel booklets. The trip led to many more, um, many more trips and it fanned this flame for sharing the Bible and the gospel with other people, particularly with those that didn't have access to God's word. This was when he was still fairly young. Then he decided he'd move to Bible, Bible College and he went to Moody Bible Institute and George was confident God had a call on his life. He blazed a trail for world missions, motivating others in nights of prayer and planning future literature distribution. Literature meaning gospel tracts and, and the Bible. It was at Moody that George met Drina, who would become his wife, another example of bridal college. Um, in 1960, George and Drina were married. Now this is, I, heard, I read this, and I heard it directly from him, which I still scratch my head over a little bit. Now, this is for those of you that are married, those of you that may get married in the future. This is not what I expect. So they planned their, their wedding, and people, obviously, um, offered to give them wedding gifts. George told them, don't give us gifts, because if you do, we're just going to sell them anyway, um, because we're going to use that money for our trip. Well, some people gave him gifts, and he sold them. Other people gave him money. Um, for his honeymoon, they did a six-month outreach trip to Mexico City. He then moved to Spain, where they established what would become OM's work. As we sat around a table, um, a dinner table with the staff at, at OJ, there was about 10 of us uh, with George talking. He told, us, he told us that story. He told us that he sold his wedding gifts. He also admitted looking back some decades later, that perhaps he was a little bit fanatical. Perhaps he really did marry an amazing woman who would allow him to do that. The other story goes that he actually tried to sell part of their wedding cake to get petrol when they were on their, tri um, on their trip down. While in Europe, George smuggled Bibles into, into areas, communist-controlled areas at that time, and uh, after being arrested and deported, he took time to reflect. And during a time of private prayer in Vienna in Austria, George climbed a tree and saw a group of young people boarding a bus. In that moment, the name Operation Mobilization sprang to his mind with the idea of mobilizing busloads of young people into mission. Under George's exuberant leadership, fueled by passion of believers from many nations to reach those that had never heard the good news, OEM expanded in the 60s, 70s and 80s, first across Europe and into the Middle East, then with volunteers crewing ocean ships like Logos and first of five vessels, uh, which was launched in 1971. And since then, more than 49 million people have visited the onboard book fairs that come from Logos and Logos 2 and other ships. 70 million portions of the Bible have been given in 150 different, 151 different countries. All of it is based around the Bible. Just as Josiah read and was convicted, George heard and was convicted 
that people needed to hear. After a time living and, and working in India, George and Drina, with their three children, settled in London, England, where George continued to encourage people to radical discipleship. George led OM to 2003, then concentrated on special projects, traveling and speaking on global missions and thousands of world gatherings. His authentic lifestyle and zeal for the spread of the gospel has motivated countless individuals and churches into more intentional mission involvement. Now, for those of you that don't know, George, he, he is known for two things. He wears a jacket. Um, nearly every time he preaches, he wears the same jacket. And it's a jacket, and it has the world all over it, including South Africa. Just putting that in there. Um, and New Zealand somewhere. has this jacket of the world, and he also has this globe. And the globe's about this big. It's this big blow-up globe of the world. And the whole point of it is to encourage people to lift their eyes to what is going on in the world. He's really seen without those things. Apart from wearing the jacket and the inflatable globe, what I remember most about George was what he said. Now, I'm not going to ask any of you to tell me what I said last week let alone what I said a couple of months ago. But we are talking over 20 years ago, over 25 years ago, um, that I met George Vua. And I can still remember what he preached. over 25 years ago, and I still remember what he preached. At that time, we did a few different conferences and he preached at a different, different locations. The reason why I can remember what he preached is because he preached the same thing. And as we sat down and ate around a table together, he preached the same thing around the table. It didn't seem to matter what part of the Bible he was talking about. He had one message. That was it. Only one message. His message was, we need more missionaries. That was it. That was George's message. People would sit and listen and, and live on his every word. But if you went away and thought about it, that's what he said. He once gave an illustration of those um, Mormon, Mormons who give a year or two years of service for, for their faith. And he said, how is it that they, they do it and Christians don't? He goes, surely we should be willing to do something similar. You see... George, it didn't matter if he was preaching in front of, I never saw him preach in front of thousands, but I know he has. It didn't matter if he was preaching in front of thousands, hundreds, or around a dinner table with five or ten people. He had the same message because it had completely captured him. He loved God. A literal adherence to the principles of laid down by Jesus. And he was convinced, absolutely convinced, that a worldwide revolution would occur if people were motivated by love, love in, uh, from Christ. He wanted people to know God, and those who did should want others, and hence we needed more people to do it. The thing we don't often hear, but if you'd listen, if you, you could even YouTube and look it up or find a book and read it, is that he acknowledges his weakness. He acknowledges he made mistakes. He acknowledges he struggled with sin. 
like David, who did some pretty bad things, George admits he made some major mistakes. Like Josiah, who looks back and is grateful to what David did, we can look back and see people like George and be grateful for what George has done. Josiah looked to David and through the word of God, it's not through David as such, it's through the word of God, realized he needed to get right with God because he wasn't doing what God wanted. And he needed, on behalf of the people of Israel, to change. He needed to repent. He, like David, renewed his commitment to God. We have all, we all have a Bible that we can read. If you don't have one and you won't want one, come and see me and I will get you one. And we all have people that we can look back on. But they may not even be back hundreds, thousands years ago. They may actually be people in this room that you can look to to help you. There are people around to encourage us to seek and follow God's calling. And we love God by knowing his word and reading his word. We're going to take communion together. Communion, communion is something that sometimes we rush through it. But in a way, communion is the example that George had. You know, this literal love that Christ showed by giving his life for us. And if we, are, if we can grasp that, we will be motivated. Not so that it's like our ability to do anything fancy, but we will be motivated to point people to him. I have two simple questions for us to think about why we take communion. What we're going to do is we are going to have a song that we can listen to as well. But these are the two simple questions. Whose example do we or do you follow? And what example are we or are you leaving for others to follow? Whose example do we follow? What example are we leaving for others to follow? George left an example for thousands of people. But he's not the important one. David with all the wonderful things that he did, is not the important one. The song we will um, listen to, it's an old, oldish song. Um, if you're not careful, you might think it's a contradiction to what I've just said. Because the lyrics say, I don't want to leave a legacy. And I've just been talking about who are we looking to, who people like George leaving this legacy. The lyrics go on to say, I don't want to leave a legacy. It's all about Jesus. And that's what these people that did leave a legacy did. It's not about how amazing this person is or that person is. It's about the person they are following, Christ. They're the important ones. George is no longer with us. And I would hesitant, I would be hesitant to say anything offensive. But I think he would say, I don't care that I'm not here. 
I want you to be looking to Christ. And what greater way of that than sharing communion? Because as we know so many times, we have taken, shared a meal together around communion, that this is Christ's body which is broken for us, Christ's blood which is poured out for us. This is God, this is love in a practical way that we can see it. And we know it because we can read about it and we can engage in the Holy Spirit who is present with us. So please, who's example are we following and whose example what example are we leaving for others to follow